are, uh, we've been f feeding the crows like probably a year and a half now and they've come really comfortable with us. Uh, they've come around, well, right at daybreak. Uh, they've uh, let me sleep in a little bit <laughs> and they'd come to the wire and even right on the roof of the um, our front porch and that's where my bedroom is kind of cracked open. They start, you know, cawing and they have uh, two baby crows that was probably born in, in the spring or so and they've got a, a screech more than a caw. So they're the ones that are like, uh, and they're probably teenagers so they're, they need more uh, protein. So we've been going up and feeding them peanuts shelled peanuts and they love them and once in a while when we have like left left oh like oh, over chicken or meat yeah. oh they love that holy jeez my older siblings for corrections in words or, or pronunciations yeah so we are fortunate we're we're probably one of the only families that there's maybe two more families in Tobik that have all all of the siblings can speak fluently. So, do you have any younger ones to teach us? Um, you know how how we're brainwashed when we go to yep. uh, the day school, or the the Catholic day school I went to, and the provincial schools. That even even my grandparents at one time said that we need to learn the English language to, if we want to succeed in in life. And uh, um, and that, that's so. I um, I did start teaching my daughter. She's she's thirty uh, thirty three now, and she still remembers certain words and phrases and stuff. But um, and and then she moved to New York. So, but no, um, unfortunately, we don't have our. Uh, in, None of my nieces nor nephews are, are fluent, so. Yeah. So the water has gone up a little. Or should we uh, rest? Yeah, I'd like to share a story with you, Dennis, of back in, I believe it was around 1994 or 1995, of, um, I was taking um, my courses up at UNB and at STU, and the UNB had, uh, had brought through their Native, Native Studies program, William Commando, who's, uh, one of the last wampum belt readers and um, wampum belt carriers. He was from uh, Manawaki. And back then he was around 78 years old or so. Anyway, he came to uh, address us and um, his, his grandson, uh, a really tall, tall uh, Manawaki man, uh, uh, I think th there, they're from the, um, I forget which nation, but anyway, uh, the, the Algonquin nation. So anyway, uh, William's grandson was probably six foot two, six foot four, but big, big, striking young, young man, uh, dragged in this uh, suitcase. It was prior to where they, when they put wheels on, on, on suitcases. So anyway, he dragged this great big suitcase into the center of the uh, um, the room where where we were doing uh, the session with William. So anyway, um, he unraveled, he, he unzipped the bag and unraveled this huge long long thing, which which I I, I thought was full of rocks because the way he was dragging it, and uh, eventually he unrolled the cloth 
it was a red cloth and it was a, a wampum belt. The biggest wampum belt that I've ever seen and it was, um, I, I knew about wampum belts and I've just seen them on, on Google, Grandma Google. So anyway, um, and, and I was in uh, total awe of, of how long this belt was. It was a foot wide by 25 feet. So William um, called it the prophecy belt. So William um, started at the beginning of the belt and there was many designs in the belt and, and wampum is this. It's, it's uh, from the Quahog shell. It's both white and, and purple. So the designs were in, in purple and the uh, backdrop was white. So it was all these symbols and designs all the way through this great big long wampum. So anyway, uh, William began with the creation story and then he went on and the evening went, you know, he went from symbol to symbol to symbol to symbol. And, and what I remember well was when um, he came closer to the present day and he talked about uh, the awakening and the shift and the awakening of these rainbow warriors. And I'm thinking, well, back then in the early 90s was this, uh, again, another awakening of our, um, you know, who we call the two-spirited people, our gay and lesbian uh, population people were coming out. And, uh, and um, you know, finally um, their voices were being heard and respected. And, and their colors was a, a rainbow, you know, rainbow colors. So, so William said, um, who will shift and save humanity are rainbow warriors. So, you know, obviously I, I started thinking about, oh, so the two-spirited people are, are, are going to save us. So anyway, I, but, but as William talked along and he shared the story, he says, and he started to describe who these rainbow warriors were, he says, it'll be young people from many nations all across uh, the world, globally, he said, they will awaken, and they will realize they were they will realize how governments and and organizations and companies are destroying our most precious Mother Earth and her veins, which are the water and the air that we breathe, and that. Um, the animals will be suffering and we'll, we'll lose a lot of species along the way. And um, he says, there'll be really dark, dark times, hard times, he said. And um, I, I remember because I was sitting right in the front row and, and he pointed at me, he says, young man, which I, I was, I was 32, 33 years old, I was young. He says, you'll see this in your lifetime. He says, but my spirit will be on on the on way, journey home, uh, join my relatives. So anyway, and um, so, so he, he described these rainbow warriors. He said, he says, these rainbow warriors from all nations, these young people will awaken and they'll, the whole, whole uh, real, uh, the truth and reality will be seen. Like it's like when you turn on a light and you can see finally see what, what's in the room. So he said, and, and I'll describe to you how this, this will occur. He says, it's like uh, a river of rapids will be going by and these young people will jump in the rapids and they'll be washed down, washed down river. And he says, um, he says, it'll be rough, like the rapids. He says, and there'll be a few people following them. And, but there'll be some left on the shore to, to, um, to withstand all what's, what's coming, the darkness and the suffering and so on. So he says, but the ones who jump in to follow the, um, the young people, he says some will fear the rapid and, and start grabbing the sides and trying to climb back up shore, but they'll drown. He says they'll be left behind. But eventually, he said, these rapids will come to a nice calm river, and they'll—it's—it's it's like they'll be just, just drifting, 
and just uh, like going down the lazy river, just going down. He says, life will eventually come to that, but not before until those rough times. He says, this is, uh, and um, this, this, when he talked about the eighth fire, he says, this is the eighth fire. He says, the seventh fire is what we're going through now. He says, we are the keepers of the seventh fire, but the eighth fire will be these new ones that are born, these, these uh, little ones who will be born with the wisdom and knowledge of, of the ancestors. He says, they'll know already what needs to be done. It's like the Dalai Lama when he's reincarn reincarnated. reincarnated. Yeah. It's like our young ones who is going to be born will already know their purpose and their responsibility. But he says, but it's going to be the old ones, which uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm getting up there. Yeah. So it'll be like us who's there to guide and direct them. In, in how to go, he says. Um, we still have to share our teachings with them, but he says, a lot, a lot is that they're already born with this wisdom and knowledge. So, so when I heard that, Dennis, I was in awe. I was um, like, and I, and I kept on replaying that. Each, each time he said something, I would, I would repeat it and trying to engrave it in my <laughs> mind. Okay. Because back uh, um, back then there was no phones to record, and I, I believe one of the requirements is not to tape any of our like um, teachings, and especially the sacredness of that wampum. I, I don't think that was ever recorded nor um, taken pictures of, and that was kind of a, a no-no for our, our people. That it because we get lazy when we can go back and refer to documents and references and stuff. It forces you to remember, and I, I and and I used to wonder when I was a little boy when I go visit my grandfather, he tell me the same stories, <laughs> over and over. And I'm thinking, is he crazy? He just told me that last week, but he wanted me to remember yeah. the stories. Yeah. And earlier we were talking about um, European tradition and writing it down in a book, and yeah. indigenous tradition or culture of its oral storytelling. And yeah. Lee Marikel's book on memory serves, which was teaching me about that that distinction and how more truth can actually be found in the oral tradition. Yes. Than in someone who wrote the book claiming that they had the right perspective <laughs> on what was happening. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, and and I I remember um, and, and he talked about the crossroads and there was a sim symbol uh, it it looked like that um, when he was talking about the present day. He says, he says, humanity will come to a crossroad and they'll have to decide which, which road they're going to take. The road to, uh, to what they think is prosperity and wealth or, or the more greener road to, to conserving and, and respecting and, and living back in in, in balance with, with earth and water and air and fire again. So he said that, and he said, who will be the wealthy? Will the ones who know how to live off the land, plant their own food, their medicines, how to conserve water. Who will become poor is the wealthy. It's gonna, those will switch. And he says, currency will, will no longer you know, exist that. You know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know the world trade, the uh, the currencies and the uh, stock market. No, stock market will just drop, on you know, drop so hard that it 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 will not ever rebound again. So. Curiosity in in the wampum belt and the stories. Um, was there any forecasting of of the degree of climate change? Um, Is that part of the rapids? Those, those are the dark days. Those are the ones that it says um, that, that waters will be, become so... Um, and and, and um, he went in deep, deep detail. Like he spoke for almost three hours that night. And a 78-year-old you know, 70, man walking, you know, up this, this huge wampum and going in such great detail about 
water would be so, like water will be gold. Water will be, and, and he said, water will cost more than a gallon of gas. And it, it does, <laughs> you know. And, and the funny thing I want to, uh, on, on a side note story is I remember when I was a young boy, when my grandfather says, like told me once uh, I was really young, he said, you know, someday you're going to have to buy water. And I thought that was the most funniest. I thought, oh, this old, sea, this, this old senile man. <laughs> and I remember, I don't know what year, probably the, the 80s sometimes, I was playing ball in the local town of Perth. And I stopped in afterwards to get uh, something to drink. And, and there was bottled water. And I bought it. And I went right to his house. It was like a year or two before he passed. Yeah. And I went to his house. I said, Mooser, because I called him Mooser. Uh, Moosum is his grandfather. So yeah. it's Mooser. And he laughed. He goes, didn't I tell you? I yeah. said, yeah. And this, this was like when I was really young when, when he first told me I'll this. share with you the creation of, of Wulastog. Um, we were originally called... Um, Gilhuzuijig or Gilhuzui Skijinowig, which is uh, which are the muskrat people. Um, um, our, our main uh, totem of, of our people is is the muskrat, and, um, and and the muskrat served a lot of purposes and and still does today for for our people. It is said that their that their pelts were used by the Mandevalans which is, um, again, the church cursed that word Medellin to be like a, um, a devil or a sorcerer in a negative way. But, but Medellin, in, in our language, is a very um, spiritual person, like, like um, in the English language, like, like a shaman. So, so uh, the Medellins would use, uh, would, would make their medicine pouches out of, uh, like, like this, out of muskrat, mm -hmm. uh, muskrat skin. Or, or the fur. So they would use the muskrat as, as the main source of, um, to um, generate that power of to help people heal mm -hmm. or to even travel. There's a lot of stories that I could get into, but it's about, about how powerful our um, Madewalanag were. They, they could travel uh, across the lands of, of Turtle Island, Island and and, and further, that's, that's why you, um, you know, when you go across the world, there's similar ceremonies that are from here that, that are done across the world. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not coincidence, <laughs> but our people were very spiritual enough to spiritually travel there and, and, and back to bring back you know, um, either teachings or ways of life and so on. So, so, so the Gilhas was a source of uh, the fur was used for our, our medicine pouches as, as well as the meat was good to eat and um, still is. Uh, the small bones were used for tools and, um, and so on. And, and plus the muskrat um, lived near swamps and that's where and this, this time of year, we'd go pick um, Gilhazawask, which, which is this muskrat wood. <laughs> this is a really small, small piece. This used for um, just, just uh, biting uh, bits off and, and to um, chew on your the little piece of muskrat root and use the saliva to, to help um, you know, build your immune system and it's to alleviate colds or sore throats and so on. And you can steep this in a tea or boil it on a stove and breathe in. So it's like a, an all-purpose uh, 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 medicine, even still used today. My grandfather chewed this every day and he, uh, uh, he had no teeth. <laughs> so, so he would just, you know, use his little, uh, you know, jackknife or something, just, and then he'd get his, uh, you chew on it. So anyway, um, so you know, prior to our names being Wlastokewiak, we were known as the Gilhizwijig or Gilhizwiskijinawak, 
No. Um, but after the creation of Lustogiz, I believe, was the transformation of our name. And how this came about is that our people, um, as, as we know and, and, and still do today, live, lived and settled down by the river, even though that, that, that they travel once, once in a while around. And, um, so uh, there, were, there was a time when the Aglabem there you go. was holding back all the water. And it was a greedy, selfish uh, being, huge being. And, he, and this creature was damming up the water. So Gelwiskub, who we, um, who we call uh, Gelwiskub, but he's, he's known by many others, uh, Gluskap. But Gelwiskub in our language means uh, the good man, the one who bears the truth. And that, that describes him in, in that name, Gelwiskub. So anyway, Gelwiskub visited our people. Many were dying and perishing because of lack of water. So, so Gelwiskub went down to the, the base of what we know today as Olastug. And the Aglabem was there bathing and, 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 and uh, hoarding the water. So, so Galvaskab tried to negotiate with him to take down the, um, the dam or the huge boulders that, that was holding the rocks back and he refused. So Galvaskab uh, fell and, and fell a huge tree right on top the, uh, of, of, of uh, Yaglabam and, and it squashed him and killed him. But, but the tree was so huge and, and, and weighed so much that when it hit the earth, it, it engraved it. And this, this is what we see today. So the water followed um, the line of where the tree fell and it created the Wolastok. And all the tributaries, the Nashwak, um, the um, Nagutk, which is known as Tobik, and all the other tributary rivers, the lakes, the brooks, and the huge leaves became the, the lakes and the swamp areas. So, so this is when our name switched from Gewisawijik to Awalastukkewik, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river. But later on, I was researching that word, Wallastuk, Wall means good or great, as um, if I said to you, Dennis, woolly gisket means it's a beautiful day. So that wall or woolly means beautiful or great or good. But that wall ast, that A-S-T part of that wall ast, um, I was thinking that has no relation to water. It has no because we say zamagwan for water, or zib, or for river, or wispem for a lake, or zebek for the ocean. So there's no relation to that ast, that ast. So so anyway, so I started researching that word ast. Here's my clan. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the crows, kakagos, kakagosak. So anyway. So that word ast, so I, I found this word astagwat. If I was to tell you astagwat, um, you know, astagwat nito, like put those together or, or bring those together. So, so I'm convinced that walast means a good place where we would come together or gather or settle. And that walastug, that ug, ug is almost like leading to the water or the location of the water, like, like a locative. So a walastug is, is how I foresee it is that, and, and how I describe it is a place, a good place where our people would gather or, or settle or go to. And that's, that's where all our communities are. 
even still today. So, so I think that's a beautiful, and, and I'm gonna stick to that whether people agree with me or not. <laughs> we'll come back in a hundred years and see how it turned out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. You need a drink or something? I'll just have a little sip here. And I want to share that, uh, share another story with you about. Uh, you doing okay? This yeah. Is wonderful. Thank about you. about this time of year. Um, this this time of year is when our men would go out to hunt and to gather moose, deer, and uh, so on. So, it 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 was told to us that uh, it was during a fall time where. The, uh, the majority of our protectors, uh, we call them uh, Ginabiyak, the protectors, and uh, they went out to um, to uh, to hunt moose and deer, but they always kept back some scouts around. Uh, so anyway, uh, and they always sent scouts up up river. So our people, mostly men and the women, the elders were settled in the, so one day they sent up scouts way up river. So they went up and as they came around this huge bend, it's approximately around where Bath and Bristol is located. There's a bend there. And, and our men were canoeing on, on uh, this side of the shore, which would be the uh, northern side of the shore. And as they came around the bend, they seen uh, smoke from a fire. So they, they didn't want to become uh, noticed, so they, they didn't look directly where the fire, so they just kept on canoeing. And it looked like that they, have, that they didn't see the fire. So they went around the bend, and they, got, uh, they put their uh, canoes, they went to shore, put their canoes up, and they sort of went to look through the bushes, and they seen a massive amount of Mohawk warriors there. And they knew they were in trouble that, that, that the Mohawk warriors within a day would go down and in, invade and, and kill, kill our people and, and trying to capture the land. So, so uh, one of the bright Wolastukkewiag uh, uh, men thought, well, why don't we um, portage back around the corner and canoe past them? and do this for the whole day and to, to make it look like there's, there, there's just as many or more of us warriors there than them. So they did this uh, uh, pretty much the whole day and they would change their appearance so they wouldn't, it didn't look like it was the same people canoeing, that they would shift canoes to so make sure that they weren't the same. So anyway, Right before sunset, they sent out two of their men halfway across uh, Wollastog. So the war chief of the Mohawks and the elder, their advisor, came out. They met him halfway. So our men told him, he says, um, either um, we can go to war tomorrow, and, and we have more men that, than, than you, and, and we'll massacre you, or we sign peace peace treaty right now. We, we make wampum and then we'll sign peace. So, so uh, the Mohawk warrior wanted to fight and want, wanted to fight till his death. But the wise elder said, listen, he says, uh, he said, we'll all die. He says, either we die here or we go back home and, and we make peace with the lust of week. So, so the, uh, the, the, the war chief agreed with the, um, the elder advisor. And then so that following spring that they met at, at a neutral uh, uh, location and they exchanged uh, wampum belts of peace. So, so these six, eight, ten, Lustigwig, <laughs> you know, out, outsmarted these, uh, you know, a huge number of Mohawk warriors. So, so that's, that's why I'm still here today telling this story. <laughs> so, yeah. and, 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 and today um, we're still in, in peace with our Mohawk sisters and brothers because of that time. Yeah. Okay. 
Dennis? No, I, I get your drift, Dennis. Um, wow, I can take this in many <laughs> directions. Um, I'm, I'm, I, 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 you know, I don't call myself a survivor, but I you endured it because I endured day school from grade one to grade four. I've, uh, I, I've been at the the end of uh, many straps and slaps side to head and across across the face and in in my backside from nuns. Um, so I've. I've, I carried that uh, pain and the resentment and hate for many years, Dennis. And, um, but, but I, you know, all the people who endured any abuse from church or state, government or churches, across the Canada or, or United States, or even in New Zealand and Australia, because they, they did the same thing there. But my story, and I, I can only share how I um, eventually got past that, not not carrying the darkness of that. And uh, so anyway, I, I remember going to a sweat lodge here when I first I I first moved here in '91, and I I found the elder who who I fell in love with, and I didn't realize he was my cousin. Um, um, her, like, her, her, like Harry Laporte, and I went to his sweat many years, and and then eventually I I remember him, um, and you know, and you know, um, you know, I don't mind sharing this personal story because I think it should be shared because uh, um, he said he wanted to talk to me after a, a sweat lodge ceremony. Either you were in trouble, or he was going to praise you for something. So I'm thinking, well, am I in trouble, or is he going to give me a pat on the back? So anyway, so all the rest of the people went inside the house to get ready for the feast. So he said, um, you stay here. So he said, and um, he said, boys, it must be hard walking for you. You must have a sore back. I said, uh, yeah, eventually. I said, I, I do have a weak back here. And he said, uh, you're not getting it. So we went in a little bit more in, in depth. Is this. Each time you come to this lodge, you bring this huge resentment and hate towards what, you know, the Catholic Church, nuns, and you're not getting rid of it. You're just, it's, it's building in you. It's festering like, like, like a cancer or something. And he says, as long as you keep on carrying that and resenting and hating, he says, you, you're not going to grow. He says, because it's going to weigh you down. You're not. So me being me, what the hell is he talking about? How, you know, well, he didn't go through it. You know, I, again, it, it was about me. So anyway, um, uh, the irony of this, this, this happened in, in the spring. And I remember towards the end of June, my mom calls me. My mom and dad, very, very strong Catholics. My dad was getting up, up, up there in age. So he said, uh, mom said, nobody, I said, I don't want your father driving to St. Anne's in Quebec by himself and nobody can take him. Will you take him? And at that time, I was had nothing to do with the Catholic Church. It was nothing, nothing to do with them. So anyway, I said, "Oh, Mom, I don't want to go there." I said, "You don't. Just all I have to do is take him and bring him back, because he's going to go and he can't drive that far. He's he's getting old. So you know, uh, the old the old Catholic guilt started, started to creep up. I said, "Yeah, I better take him." So, <laughs> so anyway, I said, "Well, but there's going to be." Stipulations, Mom. I says, I'm not going to church. He can't bug me for going to church, and and he's going to pay for my trip because I'm not working. I I don't, I don't have a job. You know, I was I was laid off at the time or something. He said he has to pay for my food and stuff, my lodging. He said, Yep. 
she said, I'll lecture him about, so, so I did, so I got there. We got there at the um, St. Anne's in Quebec, and by God, that night, uh, he took me out for supper, we ate, he says, son, he says, uh, why don't you go to church with me tonight? And then afterwards, I'll buy you a, 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 an ice cream. I'm thinking, when am I, five years old? So I said, what did mom tell you? She said, I told her I'm not going to church. I'll take you there and I'll bring you back. I'll do that. That's it. So he, you know, he, you know, he was being a little, little sheepish at the time. So anyway, and, and for me to talk like that to my father is something. Because I've, you know, usually he's, he'd pounce on me. But, I, you know, I was in my, you know. 30s then I was like you know, in my prime you know yeah. so anyway um, so so that next morning Dennis I woke up early 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 and I started I put on my shorts and I was thinner back then so I started I wanted to go for a run and I can see the steeples of the two steeples of that St. Anne's Church off in the distance so it was like something was pulling me there and I ran I ran to the church and I remember uh, at the foot of the stairs looking up and something was pulling me inside that church. So I opened up those huge doors and I walked in and there was another two huge doors and a long, long way to the front of the church, the hallway. It wasn't a hallway, but a long, yep. whatever. I'm not familiar with the, the, aisle. the aisle of the church. It was quite a ways, and there was a hearty people there praying. So here I'm all sweaty, and my shirt's all wet in the back, and I remember walking up, and I walked right up to the front, all those golden statues, and St. Anne's, and the crucifix of Jesus over here, and all the, um, you know, all that that's that there in the front church, the, uh, the altar. And I started crying. And I was crying like a little baby. I said, everything, everything that I've been carrying, that you've done to me, I'm leaving it right here. I'm no longer carrying it. It's not mine. It goes back to you. It's your responsibility now. So I, I don't know how long I stood there, you know, how your spiritual in encounters like that, it, it, time is of the essence so I remember and I remember what an, uh, an elder once told me if you leave something don't turn your back to it he says because if you turn your back to it it'll follow you so I'm thinking I gotta walk backwards all the way out of the doors. <laughs> so I did and it was a long long and and these people were looking at me like is like you know they were like you know make, make, make them believe that they're, they're praying they're, like, I can see them all staring at me like, this guy nuts or something? So I remember op going backwards out of those two huge doors, and I started to run back to the hotel. And it was like my feet weren't even touching the ground. I was carrying zero weight. It was like, and I couldn't hear the traffic. I couldn't. But I pictured there was some woods and there was a falls near there, and I seen that. And that's what my, that's whole, my essence was concentrated on the woods and of that water. And when I got in the, inside the room, I showered and got out. And uh, so my, and the attitude I had towards my father shifted. I said, he's an old man. He believes what he believes. I'm not gonna change him. But I still have to stand up for what I believe in, not to get into an argument with him or nothing. But, and during that time I had went, uh, that, that, that fall before of my trip to St. Anne's and my encounter with, uh, the elder who told me not to carry that anymore. That uh, I remember going out west 
and um, I, I got up early and I joined uh, these uh, the elders out there doing a pipe ceremony. And, and I took some sweet grass from here to gift them. So anyway, so I'm sitting there and um, Peter Huchis is his name. Very well-known elder, very like, he was like the Dalai Lama of, you know, so he was, he had grown up up in the mountains, just knew his language. He lived in a traditional manner. Eventually, when he was older, he came down and lived amongst, you know, the people. But he knew everything about everything dealing with how to live off the land and traditions and spirituality. So he was one of the main pipe carriers, one of the main elders. He was, you know, he was so wise. So I remember sitting there listening to him and he was talking about um, not forgiveness. I'm not talking about forgiveness, not forgiving people. He said, you don't have to forgive nobody. He says, in fact, the people who done you wrong they need to forgive. They, they have to ask you for forgiveness. You don't have to forgive anybody. But he says, but what you have to do is you have to release what you're carrying. He said, that's the easy part. So if, if you gave me that life is good hat, and then in a minute the buddy comes down of over there, then I give that hat to him, and you, you've you released that hat to me, and then you say, man, I just gave you that hat, like, what you gave it to some, yes, you released it to me, yeah. but the hard part is relinquishing, yeah. because you haven't relinquished that hat to me. Yeah. It does not have nothing to do with you anymore, because you've relinquished it. So that's how we described what we carry. You have to relinquish it. And some people, sometimes they, I'm not saying that I've released and relinquished a lot of things in my life, especially dealing with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But the present harms that's been put on me, I'm, I'm still dealing with that. We're all human. I, I wish I was more a spirit than human, but I'm not. I'm balanced in a, you know, a quarter, uh, you know, physical, mental, spiritual, and, and you know, emotional. So, so I remember him saying that. So when I was up to that altar, those words, it says, I'm releasing this and I'm relinquishing this to you. It belongs back to the abuser. Because I was just a kid. I, I was just a kid when this crap happened to me. So... It's taken me this long, but at least it's taken me. Yes. <laughs> you know, and I'm, you know, I'm very proud of myself. Not proud is in a boastful way, but proud of myself that I can come to the realization what I need to do to become a better person and not to carry uh, all these resentments and hate because that's the opposite of love. The opposite of love. You know, you know, um, Sunday morning when I was watching, when uh, Joan and I and the, uh, the other lady was there w watching them cut those cedars, I started to get really upset and angry and started to think bad things because of what these men were. These men were doing, uh, you know, the eco genocide. They were killing the lives of my relatives and your relatives, their relatives. We need trees. Mm -hmm. That's the major, major cause of climate change, is all the deforestation and the, all the fossil fuels and mining and so on. So, so I'm there feeling this. So Joan just said, Ronnie, I said, I can't watch this anymore. We have to go. Because there was like three of us and there was 15, 20 of them. There's no way we're going to step in in front of a chainsaw and a, and a mulcher. I said, you know, you know, I, I don't wish bad on people. I, I, but you know, I, I, I wish these 
men and the mayor and the council would realize what they're doing, what, what they're committing. They're committing crimes, crimes against the environment, against the water, against the ancestors of our people. All, all I can think of, because I'm, I'm, I, you know, I don't try to claim that I'm sophisticated or think deeply, but all I could think when they were cutting down those cedars is those poor birds coming back next spring, thinking, where's, where, where am I going to build my home? I was, my, and, and birds are so magical in a way that the generational, uh, bloodline through these birds go back probably hundreds of years that 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 main family of that bird went there and nested there now their home the irony is that we're those birds the indigenous people are those birds it's that connection back again and and because as you're saying that i'm thinking there'll be a lot of people go like what's the problem it's just some cedars Right, because that that'll be the common yeah. perception, and it shows the disconnectedness. Yeah. To it wasn't just cedars. Yeah. It, it's part of something much bigger. That connection, like when you described language. Yeah. And this is uh, the good gathering place. Yeah. Because it connects you with it. Yeah. Rather than oh that's over there and I'm here and we're just cutting down some cedars. And you know, uh, I I met this wonderful man. He's passed on. I think it's it'll be two years soon. His art, art manual. I, I first met him in um, at the um, at the United Nations in New York City. Um, I didn't like him when I first met him. I thought he was a uh, um, coyote. And, <laughs> and in our in our in our uh, stories, coyote is a trickster. Yeah. <laughs> but he is a coyote. But coyotes bring truth. He'll he will he will see what's going on and you, he knows or she knows it's going in the wrong direction. So he'll, he'll put in something to trick people, to make them think differently. You know, we always think that coyote is a, a negative, but no, coyote brings, makes, makes you rethink. Yep. So anyway, so, so I, 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 I befriended him there eventually and then um, we were at a few, few places where there was uh, we were protecting the land he has a few kids now I th- uh, well I, I know two daughters and a son of his who are really really strong uh, uh, protectors of the land anyway um, and I remember um, listening to him speak he says it's always been about the land beyond treaties beyond whatever Canada or provinces or municipalities or policies or policing or whatever throws at us as indigenous people it all it's always been about the land he says in he says at at first contact he says we 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 were here living on 100% of our land mass. Little more than 300 years later, we live on 0.2% of our original land mass. While the, the main population live on 99.8%. You wonder why we have the highest cases of, of um, suicides and poverty, homelessness, joblessness. Lack of clean water. It says, you wonder, you wonder why we're 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 the highest statistics rates of all these negative uh, you know, titles. He says, you wonder. It's always been about the land, and it's still about the land. Well, I just want to before I leave, I want to tell Wolasto uh, Gizelmo, meaning Wolasto that that I love you. Um, because, you know, because of her, you know, we are who we are. And, and, she, and she reminds us our responsibility to her.
and, and our duty to her. So, and, and I pray that, uh, that our people would look at her someday in that same way, that 